Well, hello, and welcome back. Uh, just first off, I just want to shout out all the folks who have been, you know, liking the video, subscribing, you know, viewing the video, just coming in and checking out the channel. Um, you know, just put up these two videos last week, and, you know, I try not to focus on, <laughs> you know, all the, you know, the likes and the clicks and whatever, um, but it's it's always helpful to, to see that folks are at least tuning in. Um, so I'm happy to be here sitting at number 28 on the Mythic Ladder. Um, we came in on 22 last night at about, I want to say 1030. Um, I actually hit 1999 LP and I was like, come on, I got to go for the last win uh, just to get across the finish line. Um, so what I wanted to do today, a little bit different. I do love gameplay. I really want this channel to be about you know, not only builds of decks and different types of decks, but, you know, really getting to see in real time the decision making that I'm going through. Um, because I feel like for anyone who's learning the game or trying to get better, I just feel like, you know, being able to really watch in real time how decisions are made and, and how they're talked about is one of the best ways to learn a game. Um, so I think just top of the order, I want to shout out Raul as just being a really strong planeswalker. I think the cat's kind of out of the bag. I think many other content creators are putting out Raul videos. Definitely different builds. Like, I think some people are running School of the Wizard. Some people are running Delver. Some people are running Pyromancer. Um, I've even shifted the build in the couple days that I played it last week. Um, but I do think in a meta that's not solved or whatever... Uh, playing the, the least interactive, most kind of streamlined uh, deck, you know, it can be really rewarding, right? And, and really the whole point of the build that we have is just to be as kind of aggressive as, as like storming off as possible and trying to be as consistent as possible. So um, I do want to give a shout out to mtg.ss.com. Uh, let me let me just flip over to the page real quick just to show um they've been po they have this really great thing where as players reach the mythic ladder you know deck lists will be shared if you have a deck list you can reach out to them i happen to you know have just talked with some of the folks in the community that it's really great um and uh submitted the deck and just really appreciated that they threw up um the list you know and gave that shout out uh it really means a lot that the top kind of team at least in terms of like how the mythic ladder works um it's just open to hear other community feedback and like being inclusive and having other folks contribute um i've seen people writing articles too and stuff like that shouting each other out so if you have not joined the mtg uh you know spell slingers discord highly encourage you to do that um it's just a, gr a great community in my opinion um and just very open and uh, also very competitive. Um, so without <laughs> further ado, let's just take a little bit of time. I will spend a little bit more time on the other two decks. Um, we're going to go over three that really helped me out. Um, but let's just get into the list. So last time we looked at this, I had two Pyromancer. Why did I cut them? Um, you know, a little player feedback in the community was like, look, if you're going to play into aggro, which new meta tends to be a little bit more aggressive, you got to be running Pyroclasm. So I tried I tried that. I tried that as a 2 of over the Pyromancer. Um, for some matchups, it's great. For other matchups, it's just a dead card. Um, I'm more in the business of trying to have my deck just be live all the time. And because it's a best of one game, you're not playing best of three, you just want to have the highest consistency, the highest applicability to your cards doing something against your opponent. Um, so uh, over time, I just and, and just the way the deck plays, you have a lot of incident, uh, incidental damage from like Warding Flame, right? It'll be one when it gets Miracle, it's another one. Shock as well, um, and uh, Fire Mind Bolt, and, you know, Chaos Lightning, right? All of these can hit creatures. And there are a lot of times where actually that's all you need them to do is to kind of clear the way. Or they become burn spells and they're super applicable. So that's the dynamic, right? They can be removal into aggro slash kind of mid-range 
and they can be damage into control, right? So that's why, like, the modality of the deck, I think, is what makes it strong. I will say, I've played, I definitely want to have an aside here, I have not seen anyone run in this land, so I may be wrong. And I do think, after having played several Rowless that run the red temporary land, that just, I think it's on turn five, has the chance to give you a temporary card, that card might be better. And I think the, my thinking for that is, or at least on par, um, getting a free card, obviously very good. It is temporary, so you know it's going to leave your hand at the end of turn. But Rooftop Laboratory kind of operates the same way, right? Like you're gonna likely put two cards back. Um, I think both are good. And I think it really just depends on, would you, at worst case scenario, do you want your land to proc on turn five or turn six? I would say typically for me, turn six is, is the earliest. I think you have plenty to do up until turn six. Um, and I, I will say, I just think with Ro Rooftop Laboratory, you're, it's just able to be more explosive, right? A turn where you have three extra cards in your hand as Ral, as opposed to two, um, is just strictly better, even though there is a slightly harsher drawback. Um, so I think it's about play style. I think it's about maybe I, you know, we try the red land a bit and see if it's more consistent. Um, but I do think your choice of land is, is important and I'm not sold on like the spell land or at least for this, what I would deem like more aggro tempo builds or aggro control, whatever term you prefer. Um, I think the red temporary land and rooftop are, are the lands that make the most sense. Um, so just to go through some of the finer things, really, you know, Spark of Genius is one of the best cards you can ever have in your hand. Drawing Insight, flame, uh, Warding Flame, Shock, and Burn Through, these are all incredibly important. When you can play a Thing in the Ice on turn two, if you are on the draw, because you have the empty mana gem, or the, the temporary mana gem, and you just go Thing in the Ice, turn one, turn two, you go Warding Flame, Shock, Free Burn Through, or Spark of Genius, or even unsummon arcane flight, anticipate, or mana surge, right? Like, the more, if, if there are more one mana spells in blue and red that make more sense, this deck gets even stronger. But for now, this is what I think we've got in terms of the toolkit. Unsummon is incredibly important right now. You do need ways of interacting with the board, and unsummon is just going to help alongside these to clear the way for what you're doing. And what you're doing is this card, Thing in the Ice, and then the other one we'll talk about briefly. But this card, I think, looks very unassuming. A 6-5 worth of stats is really hard to deal with, and the fact that it's even stunning the strongest enemy creature for a turn cycle is exactly what a aggro tempo list wants to be doing. Um, and it's three lists, you know, three spells in a turn is just exactly what this deck's trying to do. Um, you might even have turns where you're able to, like, remove one of their creatures with your spells and stun their biggest creature and attack for six, where you don't even have to have a spell to answer the other strongest creature. Sometimes you just kill or bounce whatever's on their board, you don't really get the stun proc, but you just hit them for six instead. Um, it's just incredibly hard to deal with if you don't kill this before it flips. When it flips, just kind of all bets are off. Um, I'm gonna come back to a couple of the cards here. Ice Crown Scepter, it's just always an MVP. Um, it's not your best turn to play, but it's definitely up there, and it's going to get you to relevant spells, and sometimes they give you the most important spells, like Bubble Shield, or, um, you know, other ones that just, you can't rely on getting them because it's random, but they just actually lock up the game for you. So, um, it's just a really powerful artifact, kind of always has been, um. And then there's Magnum Opus. So the wind conditions in the deck, just to be clear again, Thing in the Ice, hitting with a giant 6-5, and uh, Magnum Opus, right? Which summons a Mizium Monstrosity, which is a 3-3 creature, and after you play a spell, it has the chance of getting plus 2 plus 0 or plus 0 plus 2. Um, and, and 9 times out of 10, you'd rather it have more toughness, right? Because it's more resistant to removal. Um, and also sometimes you get like a 
15 power monstrosity by turn three or four um and you just you just hit your opponent with it um because it's a spell itself it just helps you combo in certain turns right sometimes you'll go like turn one uh monstrosity or sorry turn one thing in the ice turn two uh where is it turn two mana surge right get three mana so that's one spell two spells magnum opus right and then third spell for free which is two or one cost um and it's just so the deck if you really look at it has two win conditions right it's just two thing in the ice and two magnum opus so that's four total and then you can kind of count chaos lightning very conditionally as a win condition right because it can get up to 10 damage but it's divided randomly so if they have creatures with a lot of toughness not going to have a lot of luck um and and i was really hesitant about this build because i was like is it like tim is it actually enough to have only four win conditions in the deck and i think the answer is yes like you want to be mulliganing mindfully right and you want to almost always start with a thing in the ice or a magnum opus in your in your hand right so that's a, that's important with playing it um and it just makes your deck more consistent if you put more creatures in right like delver and pyromancer or even more spells like pyroclasm that are kind of conditional in how useful they are you're just making it a lot harder for your deck to operate with Rouse passive which is just to discount cards get card advantage get cheap cards to interact with the board and to pump up your two big win conditions um and i was even thinking about cutting firemind bolt mainly because having a four cost spell actually feels very high costed in this deck chaos lightning is just powerful enough and that's why you want to run it um but Firemind Bold at times, I was like, well, would I rather have just another cheap spell? And like, part of me thinks yes, but I do think three damage draw a card is still just good enough. And you're and when you discount it to two, you can still do that on turn, th um, what is it, turn three if you have Spark of Genius or turn four if you have uh, two one mana spells. So I think it's still good enough. Three to the face often can be really relevant. Um, because you're almost always going to get, like, I would say anywhere from five upwards of even at times, like, seven, eight damage just off the passive. So when you hit them with a 6-5, you know, Awakened Horror or just a big Magnum Opus or Monstrosity, you just don't have, a, have to do a lot of work to close out the game. Um, there are plenty of builds in this deck. I think you should play what you feel comfortable with. If you like it more mid-range, if you like it more control, that's awesome. I really dig this more aggro tempo style. Um, and I think it's worth a try. And the last, last part I'll mention, because I want to get to the other decks that I'm also excited about, Arcane Flight. I played against a Rowl that was running this in their list, and I was like, okay, but you've got Unsummon, you've got maybe Burn Through, um you've got maybe other removal why do you need arcane flight but at the end of the day people are going to do their best to put creatures on the board to stop you from attacking with awakened horrors and with mizium monstrosity and arcane flight is a two mana spell right which contributes to what you're trying to do that just makes it more evasive right and just harder to block um you know you can run the one green archer that just kills has death touch for flying I don't know how many lists of green decks are running that. I imagine it might get a little more popular if Ral with Arcane Flight, you know, is is the build. Um, but it's I, I really do think this card is good enough to play. I think there are some slots you can play with here. I think you could play two Dilver over this. Um, potentially the Pyromancers, although I don't think you need them in this meta. If the meta goes more towards control, I think you would. Um, but right now, I think all you want to do is just enable Thing in the Ice and Magnum Opus the most you can, and Arcane Flight is going to help you do that. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else to touch on. Definitely feel free to comment if you're like, hey, this is the way that I'm, I'm building this. What do you think about that? Or like, even just be like, hey, Tim, I think this is a better build. You know, here's why. I would love to hear it because I'm still learning this game. It's only been a couple months, 
Um, and I just think the great thing is it's very dynamic and uh, very customizable. Um, but I just think everything in this deck is going towards the same message. It's removing blockers, it's doing damage, it's enabling big creatures to attack, it's churning through your deck, dealing damage, and it's setting up a Chaos Lightning. Um, and you're getting more cards. I just think that it, it really works well. Um, just, again, shout out to my teammate Dan Chow, I think that's how you pronounce it, um, who really built the core of this deck, and then I've only just tweaked a couple things here and there. Um, you saw the last video, it's a lot of fun to play. Um, I was like giggling the whole time. So uh, let's just wrap that up here. I, I wanna show off two other decks that were really relevant, but I, I will say this this did get me into Mythic and I really wanna credit this deck, this build with being very consistent, very competitive, um, having some really banger games um, and ways of like closing things out that you just don't always expect. Um, I'll just share an anecdote where I was playing against uh, Nissa OTK and my Jarring Insight milled their Strahd. Um, you know, it's like stuff like that. You're like not building a deck to do that, but then you're like, okay, well, we got rid of one of their big win conditions. That's great. Um, you know, there are just some really cool moments with this deck when you're playing it. Again, I think there is a high ceiling for RAL in how you customize it and in how you play it. Um, in, in the matchups. Sometimes it, you just run people over. You know, I'm not going to lie about that. Um, but sometimes these micro decisions really have such a huge uh, you know, impact on the outcome of the game. All right, that's enough of love for Rel. I want to move on here. Um, so let's, let's just go to the deck that I did put up. And um, I'm also not going to spend a ton of time. I just did want to say... When you're in a meta, right, so, so for Drist, this was uh, one of the videos I put out last week, tinkering out around with builds. Um, the real crux of the build, right, is Traveler Supplies, right, for buffing your creatures, and Alarm Bell. Now, Alarm Bell got nerfed, right? You just draw a creature. You don't get to draft of three creatures, right? So not having the selection to get, oh, I want my Matron of Malice, or I want my Yinogu, or my Peer, is definitely a nerf. Um, I still think it's good enough. I still think the card advantage and the just the ability... Yeah, you just draw two creatures from your deck. Um, you do still have the chance to draw the legendaries. And the fact that Traveler Supply buffing your creatures can be really relevant in that interaction. I still think it's strong enough. Um, Invoke the Dawn also does like a good amount of work. I'm going to show my last deck tonight, I think, has, is the best Invoke the Dawn deck probably guess what that is um but i just i think the build still has the light it's still the best user of moreland haunt in my opinion you know you get back like a nine something tarmogoyf right from your graveyard or just getting a yunogu or even a peer um i mean just any of these legendaries is just very relevant um i would say i guess maybe less so taijik but ulrich even zozu um so I just, I think why I like this deck and why it carried me, I would say mostly from like 1500 to 1800, pretty much straight up, is the fact that it's a deck that can play, play and outpace aggro, and it's also a deck that can go big enough or go hard enough for control. So again, like, Ral has that modality, I think Drizzt has that modality, um, you know, you might start with Daughter of Runes and just, you know, you're getting advantage by putting armor on your legendaries, right? Or you're getting a big Tarmogoyf, you're getting a good trade and using Infusers and Grudge Match, which I think is one of the most important pieces of interaction right now. Um, so I think green decks are probably, you know, going to be on the rise. Um, and I just like the way this list plays. I like the One of Warm Wake, Hero's Call, Armadillo Cloak. Um, shout out to Zarashi again, like you know, really has found, I think, just the optimal way to build this, this deck um, and having some, some real dynamic, uh, you know, ways of addressing uh, the, the meta. Um, I did get to craft Zozu. I did not have this in my last video. 
obviously just an excellent legendary. Um, you know, comes back on more than Han, which is probably a GG. Um, you know, I might circle back to this deck at some point. I do think there are some tweaks that can be made. Um, I There are some cards I want to craft in the future, don't have them yet. Uh, so we'll see. I think there are probably, again, other builds of this. But I do think this allows you to keep up with the aggro decks, beat out the mid-range decks, and be aggressive enough for the um, the control decks. Um, it's not too much else to say. Uh, I think probably your best curve is just having either Matron of Malice or Pure the Dreamer or Yunogu. Know, just having an early... Legendary, obviously, to get your passive rolling is incredibly important. The earlier you get them to just be trading off creatures into it, the better. Um, also, a good opener, right, is just travel supplies into alarm valve. Um, and just really trying to sequence things. So your giant growth, even though it's a one of, but the infusers, then your grudge matches, you can get the most value. You should never, ever be taking a two for one. On your grudge match unless you are dying to whatever creature that is you should always be getting value out of the grudge matches to pump your creatures survive the grudge match and attack them um, armadillo cloak extremely powerful the fact that it gives a creature ward maybe gets it to go over another creature and you can heal it is just a, a, a really important spell hero's call just access to another legendary i think is really important and so forge mystic always just does a ton of work in this deck to give you you know, the um, the card selection that you need for the creatures. Do you need more toughness? Do you need more attack power? Do you need ward? Do you need armor? It, it's going to do it for you. Um, so I, I encourage folks to give this a try. Again, I think there are plenty of different builds. I saw a couple Drist lists on the ladder. I will say not many. Um, I think a lot of people are feeling that this deck, you know, with the alarm bell got pretty nerfed. Um, but I, and I think most people are playing more than Han. I don't think I've seen a different build. Maybe like the, the one that's a green and gets a creature. Um, that, could, that could be good. I think more than Han, getting it flying is just super relevant. Um, so, uh, yeah, again, I encourage you to, uh, you know, let me know in the comments, like, hey, you know, is the card that doesn't make sense in here? You know, is there sequencing that seems you know, kind of challenging to figure out, or, you know, have you been able to play this and, and feel like it's worth piloting? Um, I just think out of the sort of aggro options that have a late game, and I think Domri's in the running here, I think Angrath is just very explosive, and I think Kaya can kind of be the same way, but I do think the scalability, scaling up your creatures, scaling up your ability to just turn the corner against aggro or mid-range, or just pressure control, I do think this deck has really good tools for that. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, definitely let me know what you think in the comments. And I just want to shout out the last deck, which is kind of a pet deck. Um, I really like it, Johnny. <laughs> I don't know how the meta is, how kind the meta will be to him, but um, I just felt like whenever the meta was aggressive, and that was a lot of how I was ranking up um, last season because the season reset um, was just beating up on aggro decks that were trying to beat Jace um, and Invoke the Dawn is by far just like such a powerful card in this deck right? because the way his passive works whenever you buff a creature in play the next creature on top gets plus one plus one so what the spell says is give a creature on your board plus one plus one one in your hand plus one plus one and the one on top of your deck, plus two, plus two, for one mana, right? I mean, you can't really get much better than that. Uh, I was able to craft Oath of the Paladin. I do think, at least for the build that I'm running, that this is correct. Um, I've seen builds that just don't run uh, these cards, but I think Oath is incredibly strong. Um, a, you get a creature that buffs a creature, so you get your passive. B, free interactive removal spell. And C, Aura of Courage, just incredible for pushing damage through and for just going over the top um so this is the construction i think some people like i don't see many people playing gorm i get it you know um it, it's not the most 
powerful five drop that you can maybe be running. The reason I like it is I just like having the ability to draw a big trample creature off of a Johnny and sometimes off of your lovely um, you know, Stoneforge Mystic, you'll get a haste card. And so you drop this, you give it haste, you beat through something, and you get a grudge match. Um, and I just think sometimes it gives you the card advantage that you need. Um, Barreling Hippo, funnily enough, I was not playing when I was when I was ranking up uh, yesterday. Um, and, and I would say Ajani kind of got me, when I was hitting more aggro decks, it got me from around 1800 to 1900. Um, I think it's it's going to really depend on what you're seeing. But I do think Barreling Hippo is kind of a must-include. And the reason why is it's just so often you've got like a 5-5 five, five untested rookie or like a big Tarmogoyf or even a big Tusker um, or Kincaller, right, which comes in as a 4-4. Four, four, it's often getting buffed. Um, I think Hippo is what you need to push through the damage. I think you need to be giving your creatures trample. Um, it doesn't have haste. It doesn't. It, you don't get bonuses from buffing, but you're just giving all of your your creatures that have been buffed in the game, you know, the ability to trample. Um, sorry, I started with the top end, but I just wanted to talk about those cards real quick. Um, I feel like this is pretty standard, right? Invoked it on hyper efficient. Talked about that untested rookie. Just kind of your premier one draw. Skirmisher. I've heard people who are like, this card is bad. I think I was with them at some point, but I now think with Invoke the Dawn and having Oath of the Paladin, um, I think it's just good enough. You know, It's just going to end up being like a five-something trampler pretty easily. Um, Thalia, I just think, is a good auto-include. Um, it's going to affect your opponent uh, at some point. It's a three-minute, it's a two-minute three-two. Um, Devoted Steed, obviously, an auto-include. Tarmogoyf, ton of work in this deck. Again, Combo with Moreland Haunt in the late game. Uh, you've got Tusker, your big stat stick. Infuser, again, doing tons of work with Grudge Match. Um, so you'll notice two of these decks are running Grudge Match. I just think interacting with your opponent early right now is crucial, right? At least if you're playing into, um, into Rel. Watch Wolf, again, you know, the most efficient creature in, in the game. Um, now, this is kind of a pet card of mine. I don't know how good it is. I really felt like... I feel like this card only belongs in this deck, in Domri, because it's a creature, right, that counts toward... So, creature meaning counting towards Domri's passive, and a buff counting towards Ajani's passive. So I think it just inherently synergizes with both of those decks the best. Um, I think Tracker's probably better in Ajani than it is in Domri, and the reason being, right, is you're just going to have big, dumb creatures that are sitting on the board. So why not play a 3-mana three 3-2 three that then gives you a free fight spell? Um, sometimes you copy this with Leon and Kincaller. Sometimes it's it's uh, coming back to your hand with flying uh, from good old Moreland Haunt, right, and giving you another chance to fight. Um, I just feel like this card belongs in this deck. I just haven't seen a ton of people playing it. Maybe it's a little too inefficient, um, but... I think if you're running into a lot of aggro and you've been, you know, you haven't included this card in your green deck, but especially in Johnny or, or uh, Johnny or Domri, I think you should try it um, and see see how it feels for you. Um, King Color, pretty self explanatory. Even Tour Guide, just giving your creatures evasion and the fact that it buffs, therefore you get the a uh, Johnny passive is great. I, I still think this card's just very solid. Um, it's a 2-3 flyer for 4. Often it's going to be buffed, right, because it's coming down later. Um, and it's just going to give your, like, Tarmogoyfs and your Watch Wolves or your, um, you know, Colonial Tuskers uh, the ability to get damage in uh, and flying. Because I feel like the way a Johnny kind of plays out, right, ideally you've got a one drop off of Oath, Untested Rookie, or Skirmisher. You're often buffing it with Steed or Invoke the Dawn or Elvish Infuser. And then, like, as you're basically answering your opponent's early plays, you just want to keep pushing damage through and pushing damage through. And I think Ajani just has a pretty tough matchup into control, and that's why I would stay away from it if that's what you're seeing. It's just, it's not really fast enough to do it. I think it can win the matchup. I don't think it's, like, 
a 70 30 split you know where 70 percent of the time you're losing um but i think you're not favored um because they can just answer your your threats but man crudge match does so much work in this deck um so the fact that it like buffs your next creature and is killing one of their creatures is just for two mana so good um and Stoneforge, again, giving you a bit of modality in how you want to punch through damage. And I think Barreling Hippo, if I've been playing this deck a bit more, and I probably will throw it up on the stream um, and on YouTube, uh, I think Barreling Hippo probably makes this deck a lot better. And it's possible I just cut Gorm and put in Barreling Hippo uh, as a 2x. Um, but for now, I'm kind of just trying, uh, you know, these kind of one-ofs and seeing, seeing what sort of works. Um, so again... Uh, as you can tell, I'm very excited to talk about these decks. Uh, I would play this deck into aggro, and I think it's got a good matchup into mid-range decks. It's definitely going to hurt into the control matchup. So that's why I wanted to start with Ral, and I wanted to start with Drist, because I think they have answers and modality to all types of decks, whereas the Johnny's a little bit more narrow, but I still think it's doing enough in the field, you know, on the ladder against you know, two-thirds of the field, that it can be a really strong option to have. Um, and I think some of these are interchangeable. Like, this is not a super budget-friendly list because you've got Oath, which costs a lot if you haven't crafted it, and there are, like, a good amount of rares in the list. Um, but, you know, Johnny scales really well, and if you have access to Moreland Haunt, again, I think Drist is the best user of Moreland Haunt, but this deck certainly can, can use it well. Um, so I think with that, I will just uh, kind of close it out here. Um, yeah, again, just want to thank all the folks who have stopped by the channel. Um, I'm so happy that I hit Mythic like right off the bat because I just, I, I do want to show those kind of sweaty games where I'm like thinking about everything and you will see them in the Mythic ladder, but it's also nice to be like, okay, we got here, we can play a bunch of different decks that may not be like tier one um, and see how they do without kind of like feeling like we're we're gonna go down in LP and then maybe play not as competitive matchups. I just wanted to get to Mythic so that we know that we're at least playing against folks. And I think people in Diamond and Platinum and all of that are certainly competitive. I just wanted to show people as kind of high quality gameplay as I can. Um, and uh, I'm just super excited to show some other decks there's just a lot i think a lot of possibilities right now which means this game is so much more healthy than it was um i hope everyone's enjoying it, just playing whatever they're really liking um and i'll just close things out by saying uh really looking forward to putting up i would say at least two more videos this week of uh gameplay with sort of the deck tech um and i th and i think we're gonna we're gonna put Ral and Ajani on the, or Ral and Drist on the back burner. Uh, I think I probably will put up an Ajani list. I, I don't have quite the cards for the, the probably optimal Domri list, but I might trust one build that I've been looking at. Um, but uh, either way, thank you for stopping by. Please just be sure to like the video and subscribe. It just helps get in the YouTube algorithm. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for your support, and we'll catch you next time.